welcome to the Research Reflection and Practices Forum. Uh, this is our eighth guest lecture. And today we have uh, Dr. Nevis Morales, um, Senior Lecturer from the Department of Social Studies at the Open University of Sri Lanka. He was also the former Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences and Humanities uh, of the same university. So uh, Dr. Morales is an economist specializing in international economics. Mm -hmm. So today he will speak to us on some aspects of doing livelihood uh, research, uh, livelihood research. So hope to have a very interactive discussion. I think some of the uh, livelihood team members are also here. So thank you very much for taking up our invitation and giving us the valuable time and expertise. So here we are here to learn basically. And so you can speak about whatever aspect of your research. And uh, so let me give a brief introduction to Dr. Morales. Um, um, so his uh, work interest is on microfinance, micro, micro enterprise, development economics, livelihood research. And then um, Dr. Morales has published widely. He has about 13 publications to his credit and in several books and journals. His most recent work centers around the tea plantation workers and another on uh, the apparel sector, both studies contributing largely to uh, livelihood and employment. Um, Dr. Morais has a PhD in development studies from the Asian Institute of Technology, Thailand, and an MA in economics from the University of Colombo, and a BA honors degree in economics from the University of Jaffna. His teaching experience consists of teaching all those areas that I just talked about. Uh, he does a lot of undergraduate and also postgraduate level uh, uh, teaching and supervision. And, over career, I think about 20 years now at Open University. Uh, also, he uh, contributes uh, outside of academia through consultancy work and shares his knowledge at various forums. So I would now like to invite Dr. Morais to take us through his presentation on livelihood research. I've known Dr. Morais for uh, half that time period when he was at Open University. So over to you. Thank you, Indika for, and SEPA for inviting me to share my thoughts on, the, on some research I have done on the topic of livelihoods. Uh, as she said, I, I also have to acknowledge that uh, I know that you, there is a strong livelihood team here. So it's a learning session. It should be a learning session for me as well. Uh, right. So I don't know uh, how how this is going to be be useful to all of us, but I will just reflect on my uh, the research experiences, whatever I have done, uh, not only on livelihoods, even I mean, through my career. Uh, and would like to see what uh, what we can actually learn from that. To, to begin with, uh, so just to refresh our thoughts on livelihoods, uh, these things uh, are very familiar to all of us. Uh, uh, just to refresh our thoughts, I mean, livelihood is about, uh, studying livelihood is about how people live in simple terms what people have and uh, what we can do. So it's mostly a very affirmative uh, research compared to the previous studies on rural development, uh, which focused on more deprivation and poverty. So uh, anyway, livelihood studies also has its roots on agrarian studies, peasant studies and rural development uh, uh, scholarly areas. But from since uh, 80s and 90s that we have a, a new focus on uh, livelihoods, uh, which is actually a multidisciplinary focus, uh, unlike previously, which looked, uh, I mean, rural studies were looked uh, through single disciplinary lenses. Uh, 
So study about livelihoods uh, would need a more broader perspective, uh, uh, a generalist who would have a social, uh, economic, political, cultural, and even moral uh, perspectives into uh, what they would like to research. And uh, as for major concepts we have uh, in livelihood uh, framework, uh, you may have seen that uh, we have assets, uh, uh, livelihood strategies, livelihood outcomes, and uh, also about uh, the power relations, institutions, organizations, credits and markets, which are source of power centers and that mediate livelihood, various livelihood outcomes. So these are some of the basic ideas about, you know, uh, livelihoods, livelihood research or livelihood understanding. Since it is a sharing of my experience, uh, I would like to go to my early experiences of livelihood research, uh, how I developed interest in livelihood studies, uh, as Indika already uh, commented, uh, my background, my academic background is uh, economics, my bachelor's and master's. So I have been trained to think in that line. Uh, but later on, uh, if, you, if you know my personal background, I'm also coming from the North, uh, who have gone through the conflict and uh, even other things like displacement, loss of various things. So, so I, I had this personal experience about uh, livelihoods. I have seen uh, how people live and people, uh, you know, uh, earn income and, uh, and, and various other means of living. So I have seen that. So therefore, it's not, it's not an entirely, it's, it's not an alien area for me. So personally, you know, I, I, I had this uh, uh, understanding uh, and I have gone through the conflict also. So that, that has been there anyway. So when I joined the university, I, I, I was asked to teach various courses, which includes uh, development economics. Uh, so I, I started learning development economics, so which included some of these uh, concepts that, that we are familiar with in rural development or whatever. Uh, so that's how I developed a certain interest uh, before uh, moving for my PhD. So when I got this chance of uh, doing my PhD, uh, I got this admission in the School of Development, actually, not necessarily in School of Economics, uh, School of Development, which has a very strong focus on uh, livelihoods and uh, natural resource development, gender, uh, so wider and regional development, rural development areas like that. So even my supervisor had this uh, orientation. So so we decided, okay, matching of interest. Uh, uh, there are a number of courses on uh, livelihoods, uh, livelihoods and women, rural livelihoods, a lot of literature on Africa, various other countries. So I was exposed to a lot of literature on livelihoods. Uh, but since I also have this uh, uh, conflict, uh, you know, uh, experience, so, so I, I was specifically interested in reading about, uh, about livelihoods in uh, complex emergencies. Uh, complex emergencies refer to situation of, you know, serious failures, a breakdown of the systems, uh, state failure, uh, protracted conflict uh, so that's characterized by but by such situations, so complex emergencies. So that that was my uh, area of reading. So I read about the international literature, how various other conflicts like uh, Eastern European conflicts, uh, East Timor, various conflict affected areas, how they, uh, how these concepts were studied. But initially, since I come from an economics background, I was uh, I was more familiar with pro credit in conflict areas. So people like Geeta Nagarajan has done a lot of work on microcredit in conflict areas or how credit markets function in fragile uh, situations such as even refugee situations and even IDP sites. Uh, so that was really a, a, a kind of a gave me a new interest uh, to go deep into this area so that you know I, 
I don't know, because of my personal uh, experience, also because I have lived in IDP camps. So, so that gave me a lot of uh, uh, impetus, you know, to go further into this area. So that's that's a starting point. So I developed a proposal and I submitted it, it was accepted. Uh, but for the field work, I, I, some of my colleagues went to various other areas, uh, East Timor and uh, some other conflict affected areas, but I uh, chose to come back to Sri Lanka. One knee provided the ideal case. Uh, as you know, I, if you can recall your understanding during 2000, five, six, seven, uh, when Rajapaksa came to power and then thereafter, uh, certain uh, stability existed uh, and uh, the tiger controlled areas and government controlled areas were almost like uh, some peace uh, uh, we could see. And uh, so I was able to travel to that area because I know that area, but still there are a lot of access problems, you know, still uh, it's conflict areas. So I had to negotiate access. Uh, various strategies adopted, uh, used uh, our contacts and our friends there uh, and was able to go into this area, right? But still uh, having access to the participants was still a big problem, right? Although uh, I'm from that area, but uh, you don't, you don't have all the freedom to travel around and meet people, uh, collect data, you know, record data, or whatever, take information outside, all that uh, will be monitored. So, uh, so that took some time for me to negotiate access to participants. And one of the international NGOs helped me uh, because my, some of my friends are working there. So, Actually, it was a great help. They they accommodated me as one of their staff members, and uh, of course gave me an assignment. Uh, but that's usual uh, for doctoral students. So, so I accepted that. Actually, it's a livelihood advisor, even without a mastering livelihoods area. So so that gave me. Uh, so I was introduced to the various livelihoods uh, groups as a staff of this agency, and of course uh, the LTT granted permission to be there for an extended period. Otherwise, one could stay only for two weeks. Those areas had a stretch. So so I somehow negotiated all these, and had access uh, to the participants because they were working in three districts. The Kilinochi, Mulutiva, and Bavonia. So basically, these first uh, I covered uh, the two districts, Kilinochi and uh, Mulutiva. Uh, of course, there are methodological issues uh, how, how to actually design this study because uh, uh, although we we had I had access, uh, how to uh, go about this study was still problematic. Uh, so certain methodologies may not be feasible, like conducting a survey with a pen and paper, you know, sitting with people and recording answers uh, would be problematic. So I didn't do that. So, so I mostly, uh, mostly adopted uh, qualitative uh, uh, methods. Uh, and in some cases, uh, it was a bit of a covered method. I, I, I did not disclose that who I am. Uh, but in, in some known areas, I was able to say who I am, why I, what I'm doing and all. Uh, so certain methodological challenges were there in collecting data. Uh, but largely, I was able to have access to uh, this group because uh, not only this agency that, that supported me, there are various agencies were allowed to work in one day, right? PKI International, Oxfam, uh, Four Root, a range of international NGOs, uh, more or less implementing similar programs, livelihood programs, mostly livelihood, uh, not relief, uh, livelihood rehabilitation, like uh, uh, asset provision and you know, uh, strengthening the households, uh, household uh, productive assets. Uh, but certain programs, Certain interventions were actually developmental in nature, like uh, trainings and you know installing a certain uh, like uh, 
paddy processing mills, uh, organizing women groups into paddy processing uh, areas and livestock uh, uh, milk collection, milk uh, processing. So there were certain other intervention like uh, which were developmental in nature. Actually, my theoretical area was whether uh, whether development interventions are possible in in fragile areas. Uh, so that that was my major theoretical uh, area of uh, analysis. So I was able to see that uh, through these livelihood programs, uh, the various uh, international agencies uh, were able to actually make interventions which are a bit advanced, not necessarily relief in nature. Uh, so that provided, so com compared to various other sites, other international other sites, I mean, this is unique where uh, that some sort of a negotiated uh, stability was maintained between the government and the tiger. So they were already, if you if you had the chance to look at uh, certain publications like uh, uh, Christian Stock, I mean, who published on you know the Tamil Elam State buildings, Tamil Elam State, and also they already had their uh, structures in place. Uh, markets were functioning, uh, even. Tiger administrative systems was functioning parallelly, you know, uh, banks of the government, SLS banks of the tigers were functioning. Uh, even uh, even community groups uh, linked to both parties. Like if you look at a lot of cooperatives were still functioning on the cooperative department, like TCCAs and various other fisheries cooperatives are managed by the cooperative department, while at the same time there were new cooperatives. Uh, so this uh so this almost the outset it looked like a like a normal area normal area but although it is a conflict uh, situation but it looked like a normal area people were engaged in farming and fishing activities uh, trading selling earning income uh, so that sort of uh, situation existed so i was able to actually uh, meet a lot of people right uh, Safety was still an issue because I'm I I'm I was still an outsider, right? I'm not a permanent resident of that area, so I had to be careful about safety issues. But a uh, good thing happened is that because of my assignment, uh, because I was uh, asked to work for this agency, you know, I I also got this practical touch. Uh, during that time, there were a lot of livelihood projects to so actually. Uh, new projects were coming to this area. So I was, I participated in all this livelihood programming uh, uh, and uh, implementation plans, monitoring and evaluation plans, uh, preparing log frame. So these are the practical side of what is livelihood uh, intervention. So I was able to gain a lot of experience, practical experience in livelihood programming, implementation and, and monitoring and evaluation. So that helped me a lot actually uh, uh, in understanding the circumstances or uh, whatever I was analyzing. So that's that's an added advantage for me, you know, both theoretical as well as uh, practical understanding. So that's how I have somehow completed my studies and uh, uh, it was well received. Uh, so uh, my findings were like it's uh, under certain conditions, uh, development interventions were possible, uh, which is some sort of sort of a new uh, new contribution uh, so that I published that in international journals. So you can read that these are called livelihoods in complex emergencies have published in development practice. So that study was completed. So I went back and completed my PhD, came back in 2009. Uh, so then my the, the second phase of research started uh, because of my earlier ex exposure to various agencies. Uh, so I, I had this chance of uh, getting involved in various uh, post-conflict research activities. Uh, same, same agencies they were operating again uh, various uh, post conflict uh, livelihood programming uh, so very interesting researches as you see like uh, uh, emergency market mapping analysis it's a very i really enjoyed that analysis 
this is, uh, I hope you know about this EMA, right? In emergency market mapping analysis, like it's like choosing certain uh, specific markets, like for example, credit market or milk market or groundnuts market, uh, vegetable markets, like I see the, uh, see how the supply chain uh, exists after the war and uh, what are the points where there has been you know breaks disconnects uh, and it's, it's fixing those uh, points you know so that the market will function so the intervention is to fix those uh, points where there has been a market breakdown so it's a mapping of uh, mapping on different markets. So we have published that also as a booklet. Uh, so we analyzed various markets, something like nearly uh, eight, nine markets. Uh, and that was a very, a very rewarding experience. Uh, and also we, uh, I analyzed a lot of cooperatives uh, because those are the, you know, institutions that provided uh, credits uh, for various livelihood activities. Uh, actually, cooperative movement uh, uh, was in decline in the North uh, during the war. Uh, however, because of the intervention of uh, different agencies, both government as well as uh, non-governmental agencies, the new cooperatives were formed and that, that provided a lot of uh, access to credits, uh, not only credits, even access to various skills, livelihood skills. Uh, so we analyzed a number of cooperatives. Uh, that was also a very good experience for me, right? Uh, but then there are other projects like mostly livelihood uh, relief and rehabilitation. So I, I, I was able to get involved as a consultant uh, and continue my research activities. These are mostly consultancy works we we some of these we have published but uh, most of the uh, you know reports are for for these agencies okay this is about uh, okay out of all these uh, experiences uh, uh, what are the learning points right right so how we can actually uh, conduct livelihood research not only in fragile areas or complex emergencies but in general you know my learning is, uh, these are some of my learnings. Of course, as I said previously, we need to, the livelihood researchers should have multidisciplinary perspective. With single discipline, you know, it will be difficult to perceive, uh, you know, how livelihoods play a role or how uh, livelihoods become, you know, uh, how households uh, uh, make their living, it will be difficult because it's, it's not just an economic uh, phenomenon, although there is a very strong economic component, but it is much more than that. Uh, it in, involves various other social and legal institution processes uh, that negotiate, that, that mediate uh, livelihood outcomes. So one needs to have uh, all these perspectives uh, that's that's uh, that's that's very important to have that, and also uh, we need to be pragmatic and, uh, in the sense, uh, livelihood studies. Yes, we, we we all are influenced by certain ideologies, but I think uh, we should be careful about falling into any of these uh, ideologies and ideological positions, which will actually constrain us from thinking broadly. Uh, Sometimes, therefore. Uh, we need to be more pragmatic in when we uh, observe uh, livelihood circumstances. And also we should rely on a range of methods uh, rather than uh, on single methods. All the single methods can give us some information, but we need to, because there is a lot of need to corroborate findings and uh, triangulate uh, data. Uh, so therefore we need to rely on a range of methods uh, and I would also say that we need to consider specific advantages of uh, certain, uh, like uh, adapting uh, ethnomethodology uh, because it's about people, we are interacting with the people. So talk and interaction participation is very important without which we will not be able to make sense of how people 
uh, constitute their livelihoods and also emotionally so. I mean, getting somebody's insider uh, experience uh, in a reality of human beings, uh, particularly if you look at the, the conflict setting is uh, very much relevant because people will have uh, various grievances, uh, trauma, uh, various vulnerabilities, specific vulnerabilities. So they may not, they may, uh, how to relate to them, how to relate to these people. Uh, you need a lot of uh, like empathy, which I will come back later, right? So these, these uh, methodological uh, aspects have specific advantages in conducting livelihood research and also question of objectivity and representation, which means, uh, I mean, some researchers, critical researchers will question this, whether what is this objectivity, whether there is anything called objectivity here, so they might sometimes reject objectivity. Uh, but I would say that uh, although we are mostly adopting more interpretivist uh, uh, philosophical perspectives in, in these studies, uh, the researcher also needs to adopt certain objectivity in reporting. Uh, but critical researchers may counter this argument because they might say that they are trying to bring out marginalized views, uh, therefore uh, taking a particular stand is very important rather than uh, being uh, objective, right? And question of representation, uh, that is who you are uh, at the time of conducting research. Uh, say with, with regard to uh, seeing myself, you know, who, who I am when I'm conducting research with these people, am I not part of this community? Uh, what I'm representing, right? So we need some clarity whether we are going to uh, distance ourselves uh, from the community while uh, when making inquiries or whether you consider yourself part of this you know, or what you represent there, you know? Uh, so those questions uh, are meaningful questions that we need to clarify. And yes, there's no answers to these uh, questions, but uh, we need to have some clarity on when you're reporting, you need to be able to actually talk about these things, right? Right. And I also found that uh, beyond the traditional uh, methodologies or methods and skills needed for livelihood research, uh, uh, there are certain other things that, that will add uh, more value to your research or uh, make it more feasible for you to study livelihood analysis. That is uh, particularly empathy, but listen, listening attentively and try to relate yourself to their circumstances. These are more human qualities, uh, soft, uh, not soft skills, but actually certain competencies, right? Uh, that are very much needed, right? Because you cannot be indifferent to uh, people, right? So you need to have empathy, but also, as I previously said, the objectivity also should be maintained, right? When you come out of the city, uh, trust building is very important. Particularly, I faced a lot of challenges in uh, building trust because people won't uh, open uh, themselves to outsiders. These are some of the methodological challenges. Uh, uh, no, they, they are not uh, Simple innocence. I mean, rural people does not mean they are innocent people and uh, you know, naive and all. They are very strategic. Uh, they can manipulate. Uh, they can be very political with regard to their participation with us. Uh, you know that already. So therefore, we also need to be adequately skeptical about uh, about what we are observing while being empathetic. You know? We need to uh, do a lot of triangulation work. That's why multiple methods are needed and uh, even casual conversation and and uh, going extra mile and you know socializing people whenever whenever it is possible right having a cup of tea with them uh, and also be cautious about going native i'm sure you know what this is uh, some sometimes we become very passionate and become advocates of their causes right uh, and then uh, so that that may uh, lead to more biases. So I'm just 
mentioning this is not that I, I was a victim of this, but I have heard from my colleagues uh, happening this in other areas. Right, so those are some of the things I would like to emphasize uh, as learning, right? And then the, this is the last thing I would like to talk about, ethics and politics of research. Uh, most of these consultancy works which I have done, livelihood research are funded by donor agencies, uh, you know, either a program funding or research funding. So there, are, there can be... Uh, uh, different ethical dilemmas uh, in the areas of sampling, data collection and reporting, because uh, without the support of these agencies, you, you won't be able to have access to many things, like not only the sites, but participants and various other, uh, other things. So therefore, there is a possibility of agencies influencing the sampling, data collection, and, you know, even reporting. So we need to be cautious about uh, uh, these things and we, we need to ensure that sampling is done by us, uh, of course, uh, in consultation with others and even during data collection, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, I have seen the, the, the staff of these agencies come and sit with us, particularly field assistants. So we have politely told them, you know, that we would like this be conducted independently, right? Uh, so they cooperated. So it can be negotiated, right? Of course, they they, they have the opportunity to, you know, uh, brief their participants beforehand. But uh, as uh, experienced researchers, you know how to how to cross check data and avoid these uh, whatever uh, you know biases. So, but some institutions are very learning institutions. I mean, they they are. They are quite open to receive any feedback on livelihoods and they don't mind being uh, receiving critical uh, comments and maybe findings that are not, uh, not expected previously. Like so that there are of course less pressure for us and freedom in reporting, but there are some organizations which are very, uh, very, 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 very much concerned about their perform because they sell their, uh, you know, sell these projects uh, and uh, and uh, designs in other countries so so we we encountered uh, problems like this for example uh, we conducted a study on livelihood uh, rehabilitation it was a consortium of three or four agencies and uh, so certain findings were very critical in the sense uh, this project has implemented or so installed a particular reporting system like uh, fault reporting or whatever from livelihood recipient to certain you know groups uh, it was all very well done but uh, this probably did not work so there were a lot of failures in this livelihood assets uh, so there was reportings like that uh, so this agency was was uh, was very worried and uh, they wanted us to change this finding and also they wanted uh, wanted the uh, people who reported this aware at, at least to say you know which in which from which sites uh, these are coming and also we so we we were sticking to sticking to this and said no that's that's the confidentiality of the trust that we should not be revealing those things. You have to accept this finding. So we negotiated and, and then finally uh, that reporting went like that uh, with, with certain clarifications of that. So such things can occur in livelihood research, particularly if it is funded research. So there's a lot of politics uh, in, in this research. You know very well, I mean, SEPA has, is a, as a research organization must have, have had experience on this already, right? So how to overcome these things? Of course, we need to be faithful to our professional norms, whatever it is. Although you are a consultant, uh, we need to be committed to our professional norms and stick to those standards. Uh, but of course, because of this uh, practical situation, you also have to negotiate and Try to educate people, persuade them, and convince them. You know why it should be like that. Uh, so, in such ways, you can uh, retain your reputation and also credibility of your research. Uh, 
things like that. So, so that's basically, you know, I, I have uh, through these slides, but but we can discuss more if uh, there are any other important points that you would like me to elaborate. So thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, I just want to mention about the next uh, event, which we will uh, have on the 11th of May at 4 p.m. Our ninth lecture will be by the International Health Research Institute. And uh, it will be on nutrition uh, as a basic need. And this will be also about it. So thank you all for coming and thank you Patrick, Philini and the others who uh, were online uh, joining us today and thank you so much for us for taking your time and coming. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.